Welcome to the show today. Today, I have Reshma Ramachandran on the show, and I'm very excited to have her here. She's a vice president at ABB, and we're going to talk about um, her story a bit. We'll talk about lessons learned. we talk about leadership. Super excited to have her here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks very much for having me on the show. I was very inspired by the videos that you've done, and honestly, it's an honor to be with you here. Thank you so much. So let's dive right into your story. Tell me a bit more about you and sort of like your background and basically where you're coming from in that sense. And what's the, what's the story that got you from where you're coming from to basically where you are today? Uh, it's a very long story. I'll try to keep it as short as possible. So I was born and raised in India and in the rural part of India. So it's not uh, any of the metro cities that you would have heard. It's not Delhi. It's not Mumbai. It's not Chennai. I grew up in the rural part of India and... Uh, um, you know, growing up was, I wouldn't say it was bad because we had a lot of things, but we also didn't have a lot of things, right? So one of the things that we didn't have was reliable power. And uh, I grew up, uh, India is very competitive when it comes to education. So we had, you know, examinations all the time. And I grew up actually studying for all these exams uh, under candlelight or petroleum lamp. And this has been something that has stuck with me subconsciously. I wouldn't necessarily say that, you know, had you asked me about 30 years back what my purpose in life was, I would tell you it was bringing power to the world. No, but this has been something that has stuck with me all through. I went on to do my engineering, uh, both the bachelor's and master's, and I joined a, an Indian conglomerate and ironically started by two Dutch engineers um, uh, who were into actually bringing power. So power generation maybe. So I started with them in India, traveled a lot of the world, uh, and I have lived in three continents, over 10 countries, uh, but always stuck to power, uh, generation, and now with ABB into distribution as well. So I would say, you know, Switzerland was not, I live in Switzerland at the moment, not necessarily by plan, but totally where the trajectory took me. Very interesting. And if you look back, what do you feel like was a defining moment? Was there something where you say that on, on my journey was really a defining moment that, that shaped a lot or that shaped me a lot in terms of who I am today? Uh, I would say one of the defining moments for me was to get out of uh, where I grew, the rural part of India, because, you know, when you don't know something, you just don't know, right? So getting, I, I lived there for 16 years. And then when I moved out of my little uh, village, so to say, you know, there were so many things that I just didn't know. That is when I also realized the power of exposure. We always talk about power of knowledge. But you know, knowledge for me is a consequence. It's just exposure. If you don't know what you don't know, you can't even pursue that. So for me, that was at 16 years, that was truly the defining moment for me in terms of, you know, how much can you expose yourself to? So even today, like, you know, I'm at home thanks to coronavirus. Um, and one of the things that I'm actually doing is looking up uh, online courses that I can do in the time that I have. Uh, because I think if you, if you just uh, enhance your horizon, if you just open up your horizons, the possibilities are unlimited. And I think what happens with our day-to-day -day life, you know, we confine ourselves to what we know. And I think that doesn't help us grow as people. Absolutely agree. It's really interesting. It's really interesting how much like, the focus of that, uh, what you just said, is, is an education, basically, and learning and growing. Uh, something I want to talk a bit more uh, at a bit later stage. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about what you mentioned in the beginning about power about this field you talked about purpose already let's dive a little bit more into that what is it really about the world of energy the world of power what, what is it i mean of, of course obviously to me it's clear that it's very deeply connected with how you grew up and where you grew up right it's about um, making making a change there but maybe in your own words what is really the essence that that that, that drives you in terms of your daily work in terms of the world of you know, power in terms of the world of energy? So I think, see, there is a, a, a change from where I started in terms of power generation. So it was when, when we talk about power generation, we, we have different fuel types. So it was all about, you know, building up a power plant and how do you generate power? So that's what I knew back then. 
And now it's more the nuances of distribution. So what I have also realized, I've been in distribution, power distributions for about 10 years now, seven, eight years now. And I would say it's not only the generation, but also like where it gets generated is typically remote. You know, power plants are never in the heart of the city, right? Uh, it's always in remote locations. Uh, then, uh, interestingly, what also happened was the fuel type change. So if you see world over, we are going towards a more greener world, which means that we are going into renewables. So if you take the wind farms, if you take the solar farms, it's, it's very, very far away from the cities that we live, the industrial, not only the homes, but also where the industries are. So when we talk about distribution, there are so much of losses that happens across. So you, you, uh, if you are transmitting uh, electricity over 2000 kilometers, for example, it's unbelievable how much we lose over these 2000 kilometers. So for me, something that drives me is, or brings me uh, into the real purpose of what I do is to, you know, this is where I go back to where I grew. So even if you were to save 0.01% of the energy that gets transmitted, you know, it can light up a hundred homes, thousand homes. Because what you need is not too much of an, especially when you take the developing countries like India or uh, Africa, uh, you know, we, we still don't have appliances, right? What, what Europe is used to, or the Western world is used to, you don't have the dishwashers, you don't have the washing machines. What are you talking about is just electric bulbs. Uh, doesn't consume so much of uh, power. Uh, but so for me, it's always about, you know, when, when I get, get up, wake up every day morning, it's more about uh, reminding me of my roots, uh, but then also reminding me what the possibilities are for the future. Uh, especially with the changing landscape that we see in the power sector, I would say, uh, that every day there is a possibility, uh, but then you, I, this also keeps me grounded. I know where I come from. Mm, I love that. I love what you basically said in terms of like, you know, the morning um, and what you connect with, you know, in terms of that purpose. Because I think a lot, of, a lot of people don't have that connection to purpose and don't, I mean, or, or, or not as regular as, 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 as we should, because I think uh, it's so easy to go into the day um, you know, with a sense of busyness and a sense of hurry and not feeling connected to that, to that sense of purpose and, and sense of why really, like why is it that we're even getting up and why is it beyond like the, just the short term thinking of, okay, profit, paycheck, what can we do results and stuff like that, right? So really interesting, really interesting. So let's talk a bit more about your journey in terms of lessons learned. I'm sure along your journey of, you know, coming uh, to a place now where you're leading this huge team, basically, this global organization um, within AVB, um, that you learned a couple of interesting lessons. Is there, is there one that you want to start with pointing out, sort of like a, a really interesting, important lesson that you learned along your way and like a little bit of context around this? Uh, I, I spoke about like, you know, my purpose with around power, right? So I think uh, over the past 10 years, uh, I have been leading uh, teams and uh, teams across several uh, geographies. And I think one of the other purposes, uh, I would say the stronger purpose that I have today is around people. Um, and I think uh, for me, when you ask, you know, you, you asked me about the defining moment, right? And I would say the defining moment for me in my professional life was when I actually started uh, with uh, this Indian conglomerate that I was telling you about, uh, you know, I was, uh, I joined as a management trainee, so which means a lot of visibility in the organization. We were only 15 of us when we were actually handpicked by the CEO of office. I was working with the CEO's office and, you know, you actually tend to believe that a lot of things can be done with authority, with just your positional title. Uh, and this is something that I have come to realize that, yes, you can actually do a lot of things with authority or your positional title, but this is never sustainable. Uh, you turn your back and people go back to doing whatever they want to do. Change happens when you actually have an alignment in the organization. You know, you talk about aligned leadership. And for me, aligned leadership is really like, what is it that you speak as a leader and do the uh, employee in the last level of the corporate realm speak the same language? And if that's not there, we are not aligned. You know, change never happens. And for me, this was like one of the most important lessons I learned that, you know, you, you tend to work in uh, these corporate offices and you think you have a lot of power, but power is never with authority. It's always by influence. 
And the more authentic you are, the more you talk about, you know, where you come from in terms of like why you have the why. See, most organizations, I think, have a purpose. They have a vision, they have a mission, you know. I think at least they know where they are going. But I don't think they realize uh, or they don't spend enough time to understand why they have the why. And I think if you want to connect people, you know, the alignment across the different steps in the corporate ladder, it's very important to also understand why you have the why and why you're standing behind that why. And uh, for me, honestly, this has been like one of the most defining moments in my professional life. How can you influence people, not by authority, but just by who you, who you are? Of course, you have, need to have the technical competence and all of that. that. That's a given, I would say. I think most people get the job because, you know, they, they, they have the competence, right? But I think the people management is something I feel we completely underestimate. Uh, and uh, especially now when you see we have uh, a lot of disconnected teams when it comes to geographical locations. You never get people in the same location for several reasons, right? And how do you bring these people together? It's never by authority. It's always by influence. Talk to me a bit more about that. This is really interesting. Connection from alignment to change. Because you said something along the lines of if that alignment is not there, change will never happen. Or change will never or change never really happens. Um, now we're we're living in a world where change is a constant. <laughs> now more than ever before in this period that we're living in right now, in this moment. Um, talk to me a bit a bit about in terms of change, transformations, change programs, change projects, um, what, what, what do you, in your experience, what do you feel are some of the biggest challenges in situations like that? And what are some of the best, best practices to overcome those challenges and actually make change and transformation successful? Yeah, so I think uh, there was a research that was done to, you know, uh, show the life of companies. So from, uh, I think, in the 1960s, where the life of a company was about 60 years to now, 2020, where the average life of companies is about 18 years. Um, and this is why we have so much of transformation, right? Because we, the world is changing. So uh, organizations need to reinvent themselves. But most organizations, and there is also research which shows that 70% of the transformations do not yield the desired results. Um, and I think for me personally, there are like uh, multiple reasons for that. But I would say the fundamental reason is just because a leader envisions the change, the organizations do not necessarily uh, imbibe it. So it's not like the army where you have a general and the general says, you know, march and everyone marches, right? People have their own. Uh, individualities and sometimes and in large organizations because we are large uh, we tend to underestimate uh, individual preferences and individual opinions. and here is where I think two things uh, can actually help transformation one is organizations which have uh, a strong why Apple is a good example I think uh, they have a very strong why so it's not about the iPods or the iPads or the iPhones it's about you know uh, what is it that they really stand for? So they have been able to do innovation and everyone in the organization is most likely I am not work for Apple. So uh, except for owning an iPhone, I don't have any links with Apple as well. But just saying, I think it's, it's the alignment happens. Um, so if you have a strong why, I think 50% of your problem is solved. And I think the next 50% is about how do leaders stand up? How do leaders actually project their images? And this is where I think authenticity comes in. So if you are actually very short-term focused, um, if you are not willing to understand the problems, and for that you need to understand that you, you also have problems. Like if you take my role, my uh, being a leader, it's not that every day, you know, I wake up from uh, the bed, I, I, I get out of the bed and my day is rosy and pink. Uh, I would say most days are not rosy and uh, and I think having the courage to accept that my days are not, all days are not rosy and pink, and I do have conflicts with the team, I do have conflicts with my peers, my stakeholders, uh, and I think accepting that is a first step towards authenticity and talking about it, right? Because I feel, I see a lot of leaders talking about uh, getting to that position, the leadership position, and being successful there. So I think we are uh, unfairly projecting a stereotype what, of what leaders should be. Uh, 
And this creates a culture in the organization where everyone wants to be just strong and successful and you know, we have no problem. And the more you discourage from talking about problems, the less transformation happens. Because transformation happens actually by fixing the problems. And you can't know the problems if you don't encourage people to talk about it. And how do you actually start? And for me personally, I would say, you know, when I took the role, um, uh, it was a large function and we had a lot of problems. Um, and uh, the first uh, discussion I had with my team, so we have six uh, regions and uh, regional engineering managers, uh, you know, no one had problems. And I, I realized that if I don't talk about problems, you know, nobody is going to talk about problems. And we can only fix the ones that we know. And this again goes back to my say, my, my belief that if you don't know what you don't know, you just don't know that, right? And you, you just tend to omit that. So it's important that we create authenticity. So I think why is very important, why we are doing what we are doing. So this is like fundamental, I would say. And I would say the second part of any transformation, any, any transformation to be successful is authentic leadership. We just need to have the courage to accept that there are problems, but we will solve it. We won't know all the answers, but we will solve it along the way. This is great, and it gets me right into the topic that I want to dive into a bit more, which is leadership and people, basically. We're already in the middle of it. And so one of the things that I'm always fascinated by is that anything only happens through people. Of course, you know, there, we can debate that, okay, there's always processes and structure. Sure, yes, but at the end of the day, at the heart of everything is people. At the heart of transformation is people. At the heart of change is people at the heart of digital is people. <laughs> so um, I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it's, it's such, I think today more than ever before, it's so important to understand um, having the right people in place for things and how to do that and how do you know if somebody's right and how do you identify that? So I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, let's talk specifically about transformation, change environment, because I think that's pretty much everything today. Um, there's no stable environment anymore, I believe. Um, so let's talk about that. And my question is, first of all, how do you, how do you get the right people on board in change, in, in, in transformations? How do, you, how do you bring the right people on board? How do you select people? How do you motivate people to join you on a certain mission or on a certain transformation? Yeah, so I, I just break it into two parts. So the selection of people, I think, you know, here is where Darwin's theory comes into place, right? Uh, so the people who survive are the ones who adapt. So I think for me, uh, every time I sit on interviews, you know, every time I'm asked to give an opinion about a hiring uh, a, a candidate or candidates, uh, one of the things that is top in my list is resilience. Uh, are you resilient? Can you adapt to change? So, and you rightly said that, you know, you, you tend to join a, a job description, so to say. And this job description changes very fast in most organizations at the moment, right? So if you're not resilient, if you're not willing to adapt to change, if you're not willing to learn, uh, you quickly fail. So for me, if you see the teams that I've hired or the people that I've hired, resilience, adaption, uh, adopting to change and learning are like top. The rest of the skills, honestly, it doesn't matter because anyway, you, your job description is going to change. So I, unless like, you know, we also hire people for highly technical roles. So uh, programmers, for instance. Okay, that is something I, uh, the skill part is fundamental. Uh, the rest comes on top of it. But if I had two candidates with the same skill, I would definitely go for resilience, uh, adoption of change and learning. Key. I mean, there is no negotiation on that. The second part is like, you know, you have people on a team and how do you motivate them? And here again, I think there are, uh, for me, uh, you know, I look at people as people, not necessarily as uh, line items on Excel. So it's not about, you know, just the head count, right? Each individual is different. And especially now, uh, I would say in the past 10 years, you know, I I'm, I'm more and more working with people from different geographies. So although I'm actually based in Switzerland, I hardly have any Swiss uh, nationality on my team. So it's multiple nationalities on the team. And everyone has culture has an impact, but also as people, we have different motivations. We have different strengths. So I also believe that, you know, there is uh, no one who 
I haven't met a person in my life who gets out of the bed and says, today I want to do a bad job. Each of us get out of bed saying, today I want to do a good job. The question is, are we able to give them the tools and resources to do that good job or are we able to motivate them? So two different things. Uh, but also, for, then it's important to look at their strengths rather than the weakness. I think if you take the performance appraisals, traditional performance appraisals, a lot of companies are changing. Uh, why are people scared of it? Because, you know, we, are, we know that we are going to get a bad feedback, right? So this is the day when your manager is going to come and tell you, you know, this is your weakness, you didn't perform here, you didn't do this. But this, in my view, this actually takes your performance uh, down. It doesn't necessarily bring you up. So focus on the strengths. There are things that you can always improve and you know constant feedback. So every time you observe something like in meetings for example, so I, I give feedback and I also encourage feedback. I, initially my team was not very comfortable giving me feedback because you know, again the position of authority so can we give feedback. Uh, but I think now everyone is very comfortable. I get the feedback as well. Uh, give feedback in terms of how what can you do differently? It's not about what you are doing is wrong or bad, but what can you do differently? Give options. Uh, people tend to pick up very fast. Focus on strengths. And this is like, for me, this has been really fundamental. Uh, if a person is not right for the job, it's just because his or her strength doesn't match the job requirement. Change the job, it's okay. Uh, but focus on the strengths rather than on the weakness. And in terms of motivation, this is also Maslow's you know the hierarchy of needs um i think you also tend to meet a lot of people uh, who are somewhere in the middle right so it's more about how do you get them to the self-actualization and this is where for me the giving back comes in. so people come and tell me you know when i tell them you know can you do more can you you know i think they have the potential everyone has the potential to do more it's more a question of how much we tap into our own potential and people come and say you know i'm really happy i have a good work-life balance you know, I'm doing a good job, so I don't want anything more. And then for me, it's a question of you don't want anything more, but can you give back? You know, why don't you take two, uh, two junior employees to coach them, mentor them? This is giving back. So this also helps them learn because it's also kind of reverse mentoring when they are, and most of them have come back and told me, you know, this was the greatest thing that happened to us, coaching people, uh, because we also learn our own weaknesses or our own strengths. We have more of self-awareness when we actually start giving back. It's not easy. And for me, this has also been a journey personally as well, like giving back. But I think this is a, a, a sure way of motivating people to bring their best selves to work. Very powerful insights also into what you're looking for at the very heart when you're hiring people. I want to dive into this specific topic of resilience. Because um, I think it's a really interesting one. Different people uh, use different words. I think another word that is often used, maybe not to replace, but to have a slightly different meaning, is grit. Um, when it comes to that, like grit, resilience, things like that. My question is, how do you know if somebody is resilient? Like, do you stress them out so much that, like, that you know if they're resilient or not? Or how do you how do you know in a in a, in a conversation basically, right? Before because you need to know before you hire them if they're actually resilient at, or at least have a good assumption that it could be that they are very resilient. How, how do you know that? I mean, do you just like do a lot of assessments with people, or how do you know if somebody's resilient? I think resilience comes with an, uh, it's not just resilience. All of what we are come, uh, what we are today comes with our experience, our journey, right? So in most interviews, I do spend time to understand the journeys of people. So for me, it's like, you know, if you have lived in a very confined environment, for example, uh, again, it comes down to you only know that part. You just don't know anything else. So how would you, and this is very difficult to assess when we, in interviews, especially when you know you were, and I've had situations like that where I feel the candidate is great, uh, but then you know has lived in a very confined environment, I just can't make up. And this is also where I take diverse perspective. I make others interview as well. So you know, present different scenarios, um, mostly between the different people that we are, the interviewers, we are able to come to an, a judgment. Maybe we are not, uh, and I accept that completely, but at least we have given it a try. 
Um, I recently read an article about uh, uh, one of the multinational companies, how they do hiring from Ivy Leagues. So, you know, the, the general stereotype about Ivy Leagues is if, you, if your parents are rich, you basically get a seat at the Ivy League, right? So there is a, a socio-demographic that stands out in the Ivy League. Uh, but what if you hire people from not the socio-economically forward segments, but people who have made it to uh, the Ivy League? These are people who have the grit. And for me, the difference between grit and resilience, and I'll explain that, grit is like determined. See, for me, I grew up with very less, right? So I'm very determined to make things happen. This is my determination. This is not my resilience at all. This is my determination. But what happens when things don't go according to plan? When you don't uh, get things, when you just fail, and I've failed so many times, right? This is resilience. You, how fast can you get up? And you know, I could fail today and I could take two years to get back up on my feet. This is not resilience. This could be, I mean, low, low resilience. But the high resilience is tomorrow I'm back in the game. So determination is required and this is the grit part that you said, rightly said, and I think we need to be determined. Uh, but I think uh, in, in an environment where we are in, the, in this century that we live, where you know so many things are unpredictable, right? See the the virus attack that we are in today. It's it was never predicted, right? So it's unpredictable. So what happens with uncertainty is that we fail more often, and the more we fail, the only thing that comes to our rescue is resilience. And how fast can we be actually up on our feet? Interesting. Very interesting. Thanks for thanks for clarifying the difference between grit and resilience and what you specifically really mean with resilience because that's a really interesting one um especially in 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 crisis environments or change or turnaround or whatever you want to call it transformation um that's a really really interesting one i haven't i haven't thought about it in this step when it comes to resilience but it is really it's probably one of the most important um characteristics of somebody to uh, to 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 perform and thrive actually thrive in an environment of change because these tend to be the people that don't just do well or okay um, but these are the people you cannot even put into a stable environment because they will they will they will just they will not they will not perform there <laughs> they'll only perform in an unstable environment in crisis in turnaround really interesting one thanks for sharing that. Um, one more question I have is in terms of you, you have a completely global organization, very multicultural, very multinational. How do you make sure people work well together across locations, across cultures, across functions with so much diversity? How do you ensure that people actually can work well together? Uh, I think one of the one of the greatest strengths of ABB, I would say, is the diversity. And I'm very, very glad to be working in an environment where we have diverse perspectives. Um, but I think the diversity itself is not what we should commend. Uh, I think it's about the diversity is always a consequence. What has to come before is respect, and with respect comes inclusion. So if I respect you for who you are, you feel included. And this creates a sense of belongingness. And the more you feel you belong to a team, and it, it's always about the teams, right? So small teams, large teams, but it's always about the teams. And as human beings, we are social animals, so we need to feel that belonging. And the more you feel that you belong, I think the more diverse you can. And the more you feel belong, that you belong to a team, I think the more you are open to diverse ideas. So I think it's, it's, it fundamentally comes down to you know, how much respect we have for another human being. Simple. I love that perspective to say, okay, um, the diversity is not sort of like the, the, the centerpiece, but it's the respect and inclusion, which sort of like makes the diversity neither an opportunity nor a challenge. Because it's not, it's not even the conversation isn't even about that anymore. It's basically about feeling part of the same and therefore by design, it's not only that you try to work together, because, but you want to work together because it's just the only thing that makes sense. It's really interesting that, that, that change in, 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 in perspective because I think 
like making people trying to make people work together is like it's like push right you're trying to push and you're trying to force you're trying to control uh you're trying to manage in that sense but if it's about the common objective it's about people wanting to work together because that's the only thing that makes sense there's no requirement of push or control in that sense or 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 forcing something because it's designed into the DNA of what you set up. I really love that. It's amazing. Uh, last question that I have, which is a little bit more out there, a little bit more into the future. Um, let's say you're sitting in your rocking chair, you know, you're 80 years old now, and you're looking back at your life. And um, what are, if you look back at that moment, what is, what is a change that is very close to your heart that you want to see in the world? Um, it's a very, very interesting question. So there are several changes, but if you ask me to pick one, I would say I, I really would like to see a truly equal world. And this is where I think we come back to the respect and inclusion. Um, uh, I think uh, the more we are getting connected in, in that sense, you know, with all the internet, with, uh, with all the digital technologies that we have, uh, I think we are getting more disconnected. Yeah. And we are, it's probably because we tend to see the differences first rather than the similarities. And this is why I think there is a lot of focus at the moment on diversity and unconscious bias. Uh, but I think for me, what I would really like to see, and I have a, I have a child, so but when I'm 80, hopefully I would have grandchildren. And I would really hope that, you know, we look at people as people, not based on uh, gender, not based on uh, race, not based on uh, uh, your sexual orientation, uh, um, not based on anything else except for the fact that fundamentally we are human beings. We are one species, right? And I think we have a long way to go. Uh, and here is also where I believe that, you know, there are three, three elements that need to come together at an individual level. Like you and I, we could make a change. And uh, we do that. Like all the, all the conversations that you're having around different topics, I think it is it's your way of giving back, right? So you're making your uh, effort. Um, the second is organizations. So because a collection of individuals is what we call as organizations. So if, what are organizations doing? So if you take ABB, for example, we have a lot of sustainability initiatives. We are giving back in that. And then comes the society. So how do these three pillars interact? And the more we interact, individuals, organizations, and society, I think the more or the acceleration we can give to this change in terms of creating a truly equal world. I love that. And I love how clearly structured you are in your thinking, which I guess makes sense. You're an engineer in that sense, <laughs> right? So <laughs> I love that very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here and sharing all your insights and, 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 and you know, the, the stories in the background. I really appreciate that. We're going to link below this video to some sources like, you know, your LinkedIn profile so people can connect, um, you know, if it's, if it's of value uh, for both of you. So just want to say thank you again. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks for giving me the opportunity.